Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And I'm joined with Dr. Bob, you know, Bobraham, the elder, the uh, the patriarch. <laughs> What's going on? Oh, just uh, having fun uh, watching the Woody Allen movie and having some homemade pizza. Oh, you guess what movie I watched last night? I watched the 1978 animated uh, Lord of the Rings. And I thought of you in that during the movie because there was a scene where Gan Gandalf's trapped and a big eagle comes and takes him away. And I remember you telling me one time, why didn't Gandalf just have the eagle <laughs> take the ring to the fire and just drop it off? <laughs> that would be the end of it. I started yeah, laughing. I think there was some rationale they gave for that, but I can't remember what it was. That would seem to have... Uh done the job maybe the eagles would have been confused if uh, one of them carrying it seemed to disappear uh, but uh, who who knows or maybe yeah, that brings brings up an interesting question that was uh, plumbed in an old superman comic uh, in fact one they've adapted for the superman and lois tv show where superman and lois get married and have two sons fraternal twins but they don't quite have the same DNA, and uh, one has superhuman powers, the other does not. And um, uh, let's see, so Superman tries to rig up some kind of powers for the ungifted one, and he manages to uh, give him the ability to become invisible, but what he doesn't count on is that, that the kid also is blind because the light will not bounce off the retina or whatever it is, which you need to do to be able to see anything. I've never thought of that. Uh, so uh, maybe that would have happened with the Eagles. I don't know. And they would say, hey, where the heck am I? But, uh, that's pretty lame any way you cut it. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're just too you're too much of a skeptic for anything, even stuff that's not even real. But um, I want to mention John John Geyer, he wants some Gnostic notes. Um, by the way, I actually have those to give out today, so there's some Gnostic notes for you. <laughs> there's another one. Those are for the ah. first two, the first two in the chat, which is Breakthrough Cooking. Go subscribe to that channel, by the way. Breakthrough Cooking, good good cooking ah. channel. Go check that out. And uh, and you, of course, get some you get some. I'm not copying pine points. Why would you say that? No, you know what I mean? I'm not copying it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm totally copying. Him. But um, yeah, I watched a lot. I watched Doug. I watched Pine Creek. It's a good show. But but let's get into this subject at hand, which is Jesus. Is he is he alone in his own league? Is he the only th is he so unique? Nothing else is like him. What do you think about that? Um, this reminds me of a line in Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, tell me what you think about your friends at the top. Um, uh, was Buddha where uh, where it's at? Um, uh, the cre the pick of the crop. Uh, could Muhammad uh, move a mountain, or was that just PR, etc.? Well, what about these that are up there in the Pantheon? In fact, one uh, Roman uh, lady, I think an empress, had a private shrine where she had statues of Abraham, Jesus, I think Pythagoras, and Apollonius of Tyana. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, way back there, somebody was making a, 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 a pantheon of these analogous figures. Well, um, we, we're sort of used to, uh, by now, pointing out parallels between Jesus and the other Mediterranean dying and rising saviors and deities. And that is quite appropriate. Um, the, uh, for a long time, people have said, well, were they borrowed? Was, was Jesus borrowed from these others well that's not really i mean to me that's kind of a moot point uh because it's not so much who has the copyright on it but uh what sort of a thing are we dealing with like uh jacques derrida says that uh, you can't uh know what a thing is until it becomes iterable or, or repeatable 
uh, because then you can see what kind of a thing it is, what kind of a thing, what category is it in, which you would only know by being able to compare it with others of the same kind. So oddly enough, a thing's uniqueness is both negated and supplied uh, by the fact that it is that it is no longer unique. And I think that's certainly the case. Once you see the similarities with Mithras and Hercules and um, mm. Osiris and Attis and so forth, all of whom die and rise and, uh, just as importantly, give us the chance to gain immortality by connecting to their sacrifice, their victory. Uh, Mithras slaying the cosmic bull, which had astrological significance originally. In the, um, in the Tarabolium, which involves bathing or showering in the blood of a bull, you are becoming one with the victory of Mithras over the, the, the bull. Um, with uh, Hercules, to be initiated into his religion, you would wear a ceremonial headdress uh, that was either actually made from a lion's mane or imitating it, I imagine the former, uh, because Hercules slew the Nemean lion as one of his great labors. Well, now you're connecting with that. You're participating in it. So just as he attained immortality and godhood, you do too after this life is over. Um, with uh, Osiris, that's absolutely clear. Uh, on the ancient pyramid texts even, it says, as, oh, as Osiris died, uh, this one died. As Osiris rose, this one shall rise. And so everybody that was initiated into that became part of, of Osiris and inherited his, uh, it will re ritually reenacted his death and his victory. And of course, that's like baptism, you're dying and rising with Christ, and so on and so on. Uh, and this really needs more emphasis. It's not simply the idea of, of the, the death and resurrection as a miracle being repeated in all these myths, though that's crucial too, but the idea that in all of them it is a, it's commemorated in an initiation ritual which enables you to patch into the victory of the, of the God which makes him a savior. So that's one big uh, aspect of this. But there are other parallels that, um, well, there's some uh, major prophets or founders who are probably not to be considered saviors, like Moses, um, though, though various miracles attend his story. Uh, even uh, Prince Siddhartha, the Buddha in Theravada Buddhism, even he's not really a savior, he's a way shower. Uh, and uh, which, by the way, is the difference between Athanasian and Arian Christologies. Mm. Uh, Athanasia said that uh, Christ, through his sacrifice, being that he is God, has godness he can pass on to us uh, as we participate in him through the sacraments and faith and all of that. Whereas Arius said, no, he was a created being subject to change uh, like us and had to learn obedience as Luke and the letter to the Hebrews both say. And so he is sort of charting out the path for us to do the same. Very big difference. So in for Athanasius, Jesus is more more of a savior than he is in in the Arian understanding, which was really, from what I've read, the basis for the debate. Well, um, when you get to that, it, it becomes pretty clear that perhaps the most striking parallels to the whole package with Jesus uh, it has to do uh, with uh, the with soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. Mm. Uh, and here, it, the Theravada notion of the Buddha as a shower of the way uh, is, is not really operative. 
but Buddhology, the counterpart to Christology, uh, continued to evolve in Buddhism, and there were many different kinds of Buddhism eventually. And um, pure land Buddhism winds up following the same logical development. Uh, it, it almost certainly did not borrow from Christian missionaries, though there were some way back when in, in uh, Far East Asia. But here's what they thought. Um, uh, let's see, they believe that there, well, almost all Buddhists believe that uh, Gautama, the one that is considered the historical Buddha by most people, I'm not so sure there was a historical one, um, he uh, was, in their estimation, the 25th Buddha, and he wouldn't be the last. And they all went through, almost as a ritual charade, the same sequence of events. Uh, being sheltered by their father, who was the emperor, who didn't want him to go out and try to save the world. He wanted to conquer the world. And uh, and he had been told in an oracle that his son would do one or the other, uh, either rule it or save it. And he didn't want him to save it. I mean, he was an emperor. He wanted his son to uh, be an even bigger one. Uh, but the gods uh, decided they would make sure that the young prince became aware of the suffering uh, of uh, humanity from which his father had tried to shield him. Uh, and so they, they um, uh, cleverly got around that, and uh, the prince Siddhartha sees what the world is life is like for by far the common run of humanity, and he said, and I really love this, he said, I got to do something about this. Imagine the audacity uh, of somebody seeing the ills of the world, sickness, old age, poverty, and death, and saying, somebody ought to do something about this, and it's going to be me. And yeah. so he determined he would find the answer. And sitting beneath the Bodhi tree, um, which is kind of a parallel to the cross because it's a tree of salvation, the tree always being the axis mundi, the spine Odin too. heaven and earth. It's like Odin hanging himself on the world tree. Exactly, yep. Oh, yeah. All the sacred mountains, Jacob's ladder, they're all that. But that's almost minor. Uh, um, let's see, the... Uh, earliest Buddhists apparently figured he was, the Buddha was like a prophet, and that again, he showed the way once he found it. But uh, later on, they thought of him having been an incarnate, nearly an incarnate deity, uh, and that he had come down to earth um, thousands of years apart, uh, 24 times before, and he had been in, the, the, I think, the Tushita heaven each time. And when the time came, he would come down to earth in a docetic form. It seemed he was incarnate, but he wasn't. And uh, he went through the whole thing, even though now they figured he knew it from the beginning. He didn't really learn anything, but he had to repeat the pattern. Well, one of these Buddhas was uh, called Amitabha, or in Japan, Amida, and uh, he was the Buddha of infinite light. And uh, if you've ever seen a picture of the great, gigantic statue of the seated Buddha uh, with his hands yeah. folded in his lap in Japan, that's Amitabha Buddha. Uh, and he decided that... Um, what he that that he could bring souls to enlightenment this takes a little background but it's worth it the buddha apparently had taught that in this life anyone can become enlightened as he did it was just a matter of extinguishing desire and craving and the ego and all of that and uh and attaining nirvana uh, and apparently a whole bunch of people felt that they had um, realized that. He had a com big community of disciples and so forth. But as the centuries went by, 
It's just like Christians saying, oh, I wish we had the vitality of the early church. Uh, people just felt this is not really happening for us. It, it must be that we live in a degenerate age of darkness where it's no longer possible for most people to, to understand this truth. So uh, what can we do? Well, there will always be a few virtuosi who can, uh, and they can help the rest of us. Now, they did that in different ways. Uh, and uh, some of them were just wandering teachers and so on. But in the case of Amitabha, the story was that he was a great emperor. And the current Buddha, when he lived, came before him and taught him the Dharma, the Buddhist doctrine. And uh, it, it dawned on him and Amitabha said, okay, enough of this emperor nonsense. Uh, I'm going to become a bodhisattva, which means uh, an enlightenment being, but connotes somebody who is embarking on the path to Buddhahood. So uh, a, a bodhisattva is on the way to becoming a Buddha, but he winds up in the one of the heavens before he does, and there's almost no difference between them. Well, he here's how he's going to do it. He said, by many, many lifetimes, he is going to accumulate such a mass of good karma, far beyond what might be needed to save himself. Uh, and this can be applied to any person that knows about him and reaches out in faith and, and calls upon his name to... Uh, assimilate some of that good karma. And now what's going to happen? This guarantees that in their next birth, they will be reborn in the pure land, a kind of paradise uh, world where there will be none of this spiritual darkness, uh, where there'll be no impediment. And, and as soon as you get there, you reach the, the stage of non-returning. Uh, where where uh, there's no chance you're going to lose it and fall away, sort of like eternal security in, in fundamentalism. Uh, and then other ones in the same tradition said, well, actually, what he did was to create the pure land. And once you're there, you immediately become a Buddha. You're taking the short path that he created through taking the unbelievably, inconceivably long path of works. Uh, so you call on his name and by his saving work and his grace, you are saved. I don't know if that sounds familiar, but it does to me. Uh, Karl Barth knew about this. And he said, yeah, let's face it, that is exactly parallel to what we say about Jesus Christ. And Bart's uh, uh, inference was, you see, that just goes to show that no doctrine, it has to be the right name upon which you call. It's got to be Jesus. It's not just the same idea, but he's the real thing. That, that strikes me as sort of special pleading uh, in a way, but it isn't exactly. He has reasons for saying that. But it does seem to me, oh, this, by the way, is by far the most popular form of Buddhism today. Uh, and there are several different schools of it. It's often called Jodo Shinshu Buddhism, a pure land Buddhism. Uh, so that is uh, about as parallel to Jesus as you can get. Now, one other bodhisattva who I, I can't skip is uh, one called Avalokit Eshvara, which means the Lord Ishvara, who looks down in compassion on the human race. And again, it's the same basic idea. Uh, he has done all manner of, of good work so that those who call on him in faith will be saved. But there's an added dimension. What Avalokiteshvara has done is to suffer the pains of hell uh, in place of sinners. He's taking the, the punishment they would get. Now, that's even closer, it seems to me. And, uh, and, and by the way, if you've ever heard of a Buddhist deity, Guan Yin, 
the goddess of compassion. For some reason, there's a transgender thing for you, because for some reason, when Avalokiteshvara was um, preached in China, they, for some reason, made him into her but it's it's the same deity really and uh, so you've got um, a, a substitutionary atonement which you apply to yourself by appealing to the saving work of the bodhisattva in faith uh, and i mean if that isn't a parallel to jesus I, I don't know what is and and it really ought to make a christian ask himself is it possible there was a, a separate incarnation on the other side of the world? I mean, I don't know if anybody actually says that, though some Buddhists say that Jesus was a bodhisattva. But uh, it's uh, pretty interesting. And uh, so, yeah, there are very relevant parallels to Jesus. And, and why? Was it all borrowed? Uh, there's no reason to think so. It's just the same sort of logic. Once you raise a certain problem, yeah, it'd be great if we could do what's necessary to throw off the yoke of sin, uh, but who can do that, really? Oh, did some greater being do it in our place? Uh, and so we need to renounce uh, self-effort, as they say, uh, other power, and throw ourselves on the grace of the Savior. Uh, it's they never heard of Cal. Oh, they even developed the idea of predestination because they said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, if um, it's uh, entirely the power of the divine other that saves, why isn't everybody saved? Why doesn't everybody heed the great Dharma? Uh, well, it must be that uh, they weren't predestined to it, at least not this time around. Did they get that out of Calvinism? No, it was a similar way to explain the same problem. This is so great. Why isn't everybody availing himself of it? So you, you have the same issues, you got the same option for understanding them, and you come out in the same place. Uh, so I, I think that's a good thing. I, I don't think that's any kind of debunking or discrediting. So I have a lot I want to add to what you said, and this has been awesome. I, but I want to get to the Super Chats first, since it's been a little while. Mm -hmm. I was going to say one thing. Krishna, before Buddha, he has a lot of parallels to Jesus, too. Yeah. Um, and, and I'll give you some quotes. This is obviously an English translation. Um, but um, one of the things he says is, he says, anyone that believes in me at the, or calls out to me at the moment of death, I'll save them. And then he says, I am the beginning, middle, end of creation. What does that sound like? And then another, mm -hmm. part, another part that I have my thumb on, he says, Arjun, through my grace, you have been united with me and received this vision of my radiant universal form without beginning, not by knowledge of the Vedas, Whoo, what does that sound like? It sounds a mm. lot like something we're familiar with, right? And this is going back to hundreds of years, hundreds of years before Christianity. Um, it's just interesting. It's, but, it's um, so much like the Gospel of John. Yeah. Uh, oh. And uh, it's really, uh, both are devotional works, really. Yeah, yeah, and you're right, you're right. He's just constantly telling Arjun how great he is and how, how high he is, how I'm the greatest of all. Believe in me and you'll be mm. fine. And I, we, there's a lot more to be said. I want to get into Julius Caesar and, August, and August, or, um, Augustus and Alexander the Great, sort of how they were sort of demigods and sons of gods too. Mm -hmm. But since there's some super chats piling up, let's get to those right now. All right. You, Yakuvi Itzraim, does Dr. Bob think Jesus is based on Osiris? Yes, possibly others, but as well, uh, because it was a time of um, mythological mixing and so on. But Osiris, with whom uh, Jews were had been familiar for hundreds of years, uh, because of the influence of Egypt, who ruled Palestine uh, in the third millennium, they must have known about it. And just as the story of Joseph strikes me as a Jewish version of Osiris, uh, so does Jesus and his story sound like yet another retelling of both Osiris and Joseph. So, yeah, I mean, there's so many parallels 
parallels Luke, there. I, I Luke, think, yeah, it has to be a big part of the DNA of, of Jesus, whether there was a Jesus or not. Yeah. Plutarch calls him the Logos, too. So I think that's pretty that's pretty uh, it's a pretty good way to compare the two. If they're both the Logos, then mm. it's pretty safe to say you could compare the two, you know. John mm -hmm. Geyer, he says, how many Gnostic notes do I get? All right, let me see. Let's let me see what I have. I mean, you're, you're with twenty dollars. By the way, by the way, I appreciate that. Thank you for twenty dollars. I don't know if I can I can uh, cash you out fully, but I can can give you that, and I can give you that. So you got two hundred Gnostic points. <laughs> I feel so cheap copying Pine Creek by doing that, but no. Listen, he sent me that in the in a in a, in a private DM earlier today. And I was like, this is too good. I got to use that. <laughs> so th thank you for making those, man. Those are hilarious. But um, yeah, yeah I appreciate that. I hear you just got that's 200 more right there. Now you have 400. So uh, hopefully that hopefully you're cashed out now. Gaius Julius Windex says, is it true that Constantine combined soul invictus worship with Christianity in the Roman imperial cult? Well, I don't know if he mixed them together, but he was the uh, the head honcho of both. Uh, yeah. He because as the Roman emperor, uh, he was the Pontifex Maximus, the great priest right. of of Sol Invictus, the invincible son, who apparently was equivalent to Mithras, or yeah. at least the same sort of thing. But uh, when he uh, he was either born a Christian. Uh, or converted at some point. I tend to think he had always been a Christian. Uh, but at any rate, once he became emperor, he knew uh, what one of the big duties was. Uh, and uh, so he, he was both. He became the head of the church. He's the one that uh, summoned the Council of Nicaea, for instance. And he was kind of an amateur theologian uh, and, and so forth. So, uh, yeah, he seems to have had a foot in in both of them. Who knows if he actually believed in, I mean, he might have been like some Christian soldiers in the Roman army before Constantine's time who had to throw a, some incense into the fire as a sacrifice to the divine uh, genius of uh, of the whoever was the emperor at the time, but they may have, well, we know, in fact, um, from uh, Origen and Tertullian and people like that, that these people decided, look, I, I know th that uh, Caesar is not a god, but it's just like pledging allegiance to the flag. What difference does it make? I mean, if they're actually, if Caesar actually was a god, then there would be some, uh, uh, conflict like when um the the uh israelites are worshiping yahweh and baal as real gods right. uh, which elijah didn't deny it was just that the uh, israelites had no business worshiping this other nation's god not that it didn't exist just wasn't for you well you know that would have been the same problem but uh but we know uh, from these Christian writers who didn't like that, they said, you're kidding yourselves. But I think logic was on the side of the people who said, oh, yeah, sure, sure. I'll, whatever uh, I have to say is uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, I'll say. Um, yeah. And Constantine may have uh, been the priest of the Invincible Son in the same sense. He might have just gone through the motions. Well, Yaku or um, Simca Jacoby, you know, the uh, documentary filmmaker, also sort of, he, he, he's an archaeologist, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. He made a video, he made an, uh, no, actually, he made a, a whole documentary about this. It wasn't just one of his episodes. This was like a whole full length film about Constantine putting up a statue of Sol Invictus on one side of the Arch of Constantine and then Jesus on on the bottom or something. One, or one of them was on top, one of them was on the bottom. But I guess he had them both like parallel to each other. Is like he had both there. Um, another thing, the thumbnail of this video, I actually got that from there is a mosaic in Istanbul, which was Constantinople. And that mosaic was put up during Constantine's reign. It's Jesus looking like a Roman soldier. Hmm. So there are some people who think that Constantine's making himself to be like Jesus. 
So that's a theory. Well, that could be because he did become the head of the church. But remember, uh, he did not make Christianity the official religion. He simply legalized it and uh, promulgated the decree of Milan, which said, Romans, feel free to worship whatever God you want. Uh, there, there's going to be no one official religion, though he was a Christian, at least by that time. So yeah. it, it would make sense for him to have uh, both uh, represented and uh, like an interfaith kind of a thing. Right. Myth Vision Podcast. Go and subscribe. Also check out his Patreon. That is Derek. Thank you for the $5. He says, I recently interviewed Peter Von Sivers who argues that Islam was a reactionary version of Christianity to Nestorianism, Chalcedonianism, et cetera, what you say. Um, and yeah, I want to hear what you think about this. But by the way, there is some classes coming out about this very subject that Dr. Bob is doing right now. But yeah, what do you think about that? Let me just... Reactionary version of... Um... Well, I don't know what the case he makes uh, is, but you do see reverberations of the Nestorian controversy uh, in the Quran, where uh, Jesus is made to say, look, if my mother and I were gods, I'd be the first to say it, but we're not. And that comes up a, a couple of times, they they didn't mind they believed jesus was the virgin born messiah of israel big fans of jesus uh they they thought uh, god would not abandon him to the cross so he didn't he was right. raptured up to heaven before they could nail him up and he would return from there one day and then allah the uh, uh the, the apocalypse of fourth ezra he would then die and then rise in the, in the future. Uh, wow. So it, it is so much like different types of Christianity that uh, it seems to me that, yeah, they, they were gathering bits and pieces of rabbinic Judaism, Samaritanism, uh, and and uh, Christianity and Gnosticism and so on. And so this idea that that he's not God, uh, that well, specifically Nestorianism, which said that uh, that um, a divine person was in Jesus, united by a common will with the human being Jesus. And that that meant it could you could only say Jesus was God once he became an adult. He said God is not. Nestorius said God is not a baby two or three weeks old, uh, and uh, that's why he opposed the Theotokos business, the God bearer, Mary the mother of God. Well, that's the same sort of hesitation you have about Jesus in the Quran. Uh, so yeah, it uh, Gunter Luling has uh, he made this amazing argument that uh, at least a third of the text of the Quran it, it was originally Arabic uh, Christian hymnody, and he right. does this uh, amazing analysis of various surahs of the Quran and says, well, if you get rid of this confusing interpolation and that one, and you understand this is an earlier version of Arabic, it comes out as hymns to Christ. Right. And that's what Derek's talking about. And and by the way, I mean, there's there's uh, legends, there's Byzantine legends baked within the text, like the 300 sleepers, the uh, Alexander the Great as dual carne and the, the horn mm -hmm. one puts up a wall against Gog and the Gog. You got the, the story from Adam or Satan refusing to bow to Adam. Well, there's a Nag Hammadi text that says Azazel refused to bow to Adam. So what they mm -hmm. did, they just took that story, put Satan, but it's actually not Satan. That's the English. It's actually Iblis. That's what it says. So Iblis, Satan, Azazel, they're all they're doing what the Christians do. They're just lump, lumping the devil and mm -hmm. all these all these Hades and Pluto. And they're just making this one big archetype of, of Satan, the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the ancient serpent, they call him in Revelation. 
You know what I mean? That's like it's like they syncretize the evil one into one thing. Because if the Old Testament mm-hmm. state is just some some district attorney chilling next to God, he's just he's just he's the accuser. That's all he's that's mm-hmm. all he's doing. He's, not, he's standing right next to God in the Old Testament in the book mm-hmm. of Job. He's right there. Like what what why does that why does nobody talk about that? But anyways, we're let's get, let's get back to the uh, subject at hand. Uh, Constellation Pegasus, my buddy. Thank you for the four ninety nine. Forty appears many times in the Bible, like forty days and forty nights. Any astro theology stuff going on with the number forty? Uh, not that I know of. I, I think some of these things are uh, traceable back to that, like uh, the number twelve. I mean that that uh, the zodiac and all that, or uh, the uh, the seven day week uh, presupposes the seven known planets, including the sun and the moon, excluding the Earth, which they thought was the center of the whole shebang. Uh, and but I I've never run across uh, an explanation for the forty. I, maybe it's yeah. just staring me in the face, and I I haven't uh, noticed it. But a great book on uh, New Testament astrology is bruce j molina's book of the i think the genre and message of the book of revelation where he shows based on ancient loads of ancient uh manuals of astrology and astronomy how almost everything in the book of revelation is is references to stars constellations comets etc uh, it's amazing stuff, a real breakthrough. So I, I imagine there's got to be some 40 connection, but I don't happen to know what it is. Yeah, it's got there's got to be something with the number 40. Um, hey, Neil and Doctor, this is my my buddy, critical faculty. He's going to be on this channel next week, so look out for that. Thank you for five dollars. He says, Hey, Neil and Doctor Price, cheers mm-hmm. for all the information and provide that you provide for your viewers. Keep up the great work. Thank right you. back at you. Your channel is just as good, man. It really is. It really yeah, is. great stuff. Got a great guest on there. He talks about a lot of range, a lot of science, philosophy. Go, go mm-hmm. subscribe, everybody. Go subscribe. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see what else we got. Critical Faculty again. <sighs> Thanks, dude. I, I owe you now. Now I'm gonna have a, Next time you're live, you're going to see me in a nice little $5 pop-up. Uh, anyways, he says, I don't think there is straight plagiarism here. Rather separate supernatural claims that contain similar events, i.e., Darwin and Wallace evolution. Really good point. You mean for the uh, parallels between Jesus and yeah. the other? Yeah. Well, I agree. I agree. And for anybody that happens not to know, uh, uh, Wallace and Darwin both came up with uh, natural selection at the same time, separately, just as Leibniz and Newton. Uh, both independently uh, invented calculus. Uh, And so, you know, great minds think alike. And it's obvious that's what's happened with a whole lot of religious similarities. Yep. Constellations Pegasus, back for another 499. I really appreciate you. You don't have to keep doing that, but I appreciate it. Love you. One last question. Are those German officer daggers in the background? Ben, wondering Uh, about... Yeah, they are. I love telling that story. Uh, my father, Noel Price, was in uh, General Patton's Third Army, and he was present at the liberation of Dachau. And uh, he brought home some souvenirs, including these three uh, ornamental daggers. Uh, I mean, they could kill you if they used them for that, but they, they were like uh, ornaments that German uh, Nazi officers would wear. And uh, so I, I'm proud to have trophies of war against the Nazis on display. Yeah, that's cool, man. I, look, I like them. They look cool. Not Now it's not too late. Thank you for the $5. Amateur question. How many parallels are there with Jesus in Apollo? Oh, Apollonius and Tiana. And did Apollonius call influence Christianity or vice versa? Not an amateur question. That's a good question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Eusebius thought that uh, Apollonius was plagiarism from Christianity, and there are scholars that say that now, because though Apollonius, the son of Apollo, uh, miraculously conceived and so forth, uh, he, uh, an itinerant philosopher, uh, ethicist, 
exorcist and healer um, who who was uh, taken up to heaven after um, being delivered from a uh, a trial before Domitian. Uh, they uh, um, th those stories are so much like stories in the Gospels that it's I, I think that um, if there was oral uh, I'm sorry they they lived at the same time supposedly right. I, I began to say that and forgot um, but uh, Flavius Philostratus wrote. Uh, his life of Apollonius of Tyana in uh, something like uh, the third century yeah. CE, uh, the 200s. Yep. But that's not all that much later than the Gospels, by my the reckoning. Same time. <laughs> no, I'm just yeah. kidding. I'm and, saying we, um, we have fragments, but like you're. But by the time we have like real coherent like books being put, it's around the same time. I'm sure there was mm -hmm. fragments flying around Apollonius of Tyana before the third century maybe someone mm -hmm. else you know what i mean but but my bad i cut you off but <laughs> and i think that the uh stories that are similar are strikingly similar but they don't to me read like uh they've just been copied now you could say that it's mimesis like uh Thomas L. Brody and Dennis McDonald talk about, which was very common back then, you would retell stories, but not just Xerox them. Uh, you would rewrite them. It could be that, but the stories still are more the same kind of thing than the same thing. And so I tend to think they are independent, and uh, that which is no big surprise. It uh, It's like... Philostratus says that oral tradition was one of his big sources, that yeah. he had gone to various places Apollonius had preached and naturally would have said, anybody remember what he, what this guy said? And uh, he was held in such high esteem, uh, they would have. Um, he also claimed he had the memoirs of Damis, who was like the beloved disciple of Apollonius. Right. Most folks think that's fiction. I do, too. But it's it's much the same kind of thing as the Gospels. Uh, a couple of them are real close, like you know how uh, the widow of Nain story, uh, where they're they're taking the body out to bury it. They're weeping and lamenting, and Jesus says, "Hold on, wait just a minute." And he examines the body and says, "This guy is still alive, or he's not dead for long. You never know what what that means." But he raises him up, uh, and everybody sees it. Well, there's a very similar story where uh, the, Apollonius comes upon a funeral procession, and this time it's that uh, a, a young bride on the very eve of her wedding has uh, fallen over dead, and there's mourning and all that. And he says, uh, hold on, uh, uh, let me take a look. And he says, uh, you know, takes her by the hand and lifts her up and they get married after all and there's great rejoicing uh that that looks very close but then again so does peter res raising from the dead dorcas in uh what is it, chapter 11 of of acts uh it's uh it's a kind of resurrection story uh so it's it's very difficult to tell if one is borrowed from another or it's just a subgenre of standard miracle stories because there are a lot of them where somebody is on the lip of the grave and, and uh, a, a physician comes and says, wait just a second here. And say, hey, you're about to bury this guy. He's alive. Uh, there's several of those. Very fascinating. And, and it's always because they couldn't really be sure somebody was dead. I mean, we can't either, right? We debate whether you should unplug this guy if he's brain dead. Is he does that count? Uh, and uh, there's a book by um, J. Duncan M. Darrett called The Anastasis or the Resurrection as a Historical Event. This guy's a critical scholar, but he argues that uh, Jesus was taken down alive from the cross. And what's more, he looks at all of these ancient medical texts 
and premature burial was so common. Uh, these manuals had uh, things, tests you could administer to make darn sure they were dead because people were buried alive too often. So uh, it's it's very interesting. So it, when Jesus says, "Oh, he's not. She's not dead. She's asleep. Or Lazarus uh, is only asleep," etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What does he mean? Does he really mean they're dead, but I'm going to bring them back, or does he mean they're in a coma? Don't jump to conclusions. It's hard to tell. And before, real quick, just before we go to the next one, the, the thing about Apollonius Satana that that really points to G like you know the Jesus comparison is the fact that he he's going around and he's very cynical and he's challenging all these religious hierarch or religious priests of different factions different groups around around Turkey and you know Phrygia whatever you want to call it but isn't if I'm not mistaken isn't there a scene where they think he's dead and he teleports to them and he's alive and they're happy to see him yeah, they. Uh, he was in a prison cell uh, in Rome. He was about to go before Domitian, and right. and certainly he would be killed. But um, Apollonius tells Domus, who's there visiting him, uh, he says, "Watch this," and he takes the shackle and chain on his wrist and just pulls it off, and it's like he just like he's a mist and just drips through it. And he says, you see, I'm only here because I want to be. They can't do anything to me. And so he goes and gives this speech, a defense and, and an accusation of the emperor. And he should be uh, getting killed. And by this time, at his command, Damas and the other disciples have gone all the way across the Mediterranean to somewhere in Turkey. And they figure, well, he, he's got to be dead by now. Uh, but in fact, he comes out of the shadows and says, hey, uh, uh, touch me. Uh, you'll see that right. I am uh, not a ghost come up from Persephone's realm. Uh, and uh, oh, so that, they're oh overjoyed God. that he escaped death. They had given him up for dead, but he wasn't. But it's very much like the resurrection stories, and shortly thereafter, he ascends into heaven. Right, and and he, the fact that he says it that way, Persephone's realm, he's tying it to the Luzanian mysteries, because Persephone is the new uh, Ishtar, or no, Demeter is. Persephone mm -hmm. sort of plays the role of Tamos, even though she's a female. But like that, that 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 mythos of. Say the savior going down in the underworld and save and bringing back up the brother or sister, saving them in resurrection. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of in the case of Babylon or Sumer, the text actually does say the dead are raised up with Tamils. Now, mm -hmm. the Luzanian mysteries is different because th these are hymns that are being told. Being there's no text. There's no there's no Bible for the Luzanian mysteries. You have to go to these hymns and these poems and mm -hmm. it's, to stitch it all together. So there's no central text. It's basically he said, she said. It's basically oral, but that's that. Basically, the um, it's very obvious that they're borrowing the ancient mythology from Sumer into this this mm -hmm. myth. But um, it's, but that's what I'm saying. For the fact that he mentions that is he it just shows you that they're they're aware of that stuff. Like you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, right. Um, that was the last super chat. And I did want to bring up something though. But and if anyone else wants to jump, throw any, uh, go ahead. We have a couple more minutes. Um, so if anything pops up, I'll get to it. But I want to talk about Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Romulus, this sort of archetype that's already present long before Christianity. Um, I mean, where should we start? Should we start August or Alexander the Great, right? His 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 legend says that he's born of a of the god Amon turning into a serpent and impregnating Olympias. So his his death is a is a miracle birth. I don't think she was a virgin, but that's right, yeah. But still but nonetheless it wasn't uh the, the the King Philip was not his father. Right. The that's god what they're saying. And this is this is Ptolemy in Egypt trying to connect himself to connect the Ptolemies basically or Egypt to Alexander. So they start mm -hmm. this myth 
it gets it blows up, becomes super popular in the Seleucid, um, Seleucid Empire, Egyptian Empire, the Macedonian. They love it. That like, Alexander Greek romance is passed down to us today. That's how big it was. But um, if you actually go to that text, it really makes it clear that he is the son of God and he has a purpose yeah. in the world to change the world, to, to, you know, fix the, you know, liberate the East and Hellenize the world. And Amon is going to make sure he does it. And it's all, it's like there, and it's just, and by the way, he dies according to the text. He dies in April, which I looked it up. I don't think that's actually true, but he's 32 years and eight months old. Hmm. Almost exactly thirty three years old too. That I thought was pretty funny. I mean, now I'm now I guess I'm reaching right now. I'm reaching for 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 stuff, but still, that it's like that's such a young, weird, typical or, or a particular age, don't you think? Yeah, though, sort of for different reasons. Um, he uh, drank himself to death, unfortunately. Yeah. Or he uh, might have the, that's just two theories on this. Two different theories. Oh, hmm. I have uh, not heard that. Yeah, there's some people who think that, um, not Cassander, and and Antigonus. I think one 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 of his yeah, yeah. one of his right hand soldiers or whatever that was in living in Macedonia, controlling Macedonia. I guess the story goes that Olympias had a lot of power, obviously, because she's the mother of Alexander the Great. But this other guy, I think it's Antigonus. He's like. I, I need to I need to get the power for myself, and if mm -hmm. the only way I can do that is Alexander's got to go. So the story is that he sends out a he sends out a courier to go meet Alexander, and then he poisons him. That's the, that, that's the theory. Mm. But uh, but yeah, but but let's get into Julius Caesar now. This one's even this one's even crazier because you got this king, this messiah like emperor, right? He he. Uh, he gets killed by the Senate, right? After he's after all of his triumphs, right? Make glory, the, making Rome the glorious, the glorious city of the West. He pretty much does this, and he beats Pompey the Great. Pompey the Great is the one who beats uh, Mithridates, and he conquers all of the East. He conquers Judea. He's the man. He is the man. He does everything, and the fact that Caesar beats him makes him the the head honcho of the world. Like he's, mm. he's the one, like he's the one, right? Well, the uh, Senate kills him. Everyone knows this story. He gets killed, but he writes a will to make Augustus, his son. He's not Augustus yet. He's Octavian. He may, he writes a will to make Octavian, his son. And what that does is it allows Octavian to avenge his death from the grave, which he does all of the, I don't know. It's like a hundred conspirators, something like that. Some crazy number. That, that were in on this, all of them are dead within a year. Mm. So so he Julius Caesar gets deified. Right away, as soon as this happens, Augustus starts to style himself as the son of God. Because mm. Julius Caesar, the, according to according to I think it's Cassius Dio or no. Um Ovid actually, Ovid's metamorphosis. According to Ovid, Julius Caesar on his on his funeral was Venus comes down and takes him and brings him up to heaven where he sits on the throne next to Venus, the God, the God is Venus. So that eight pointed star of Ishtar or Venus is, is also identified. It's the same symbol you see in Rome as you see in, in Sumer. They're, 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 they're well aware. This is an ancient archetypal mm. symbol. Well, this is on the coins of Caesar. I wish I had this on here. I think I do actually. Uh, let me see if I have it here. I'll find it. Um, but anyways, this co these coins that are in circulation say son of God, and it's got the, the eight pointed star of Venus. And, um, what I'm, what I'm getting at is, okay, so now you have Augustus who calls himself the son of God, right? He goes to war with Mark Antony and does basically the same. He basically re repeats the Caesar Pompey thing where instead of the first triumvate, second triumvate. And now Augustus gets on top, and he implements the Pax Romana, this 40 years of peace. And he is even called, you know, like, the, he, the, he gets this big cult after him. Even Philo was writing about him and saying that he calmed the storms that were raging from east and west. Like, he is the, the ultimate sa savior archetypal son of God figure. 
And this is just, dec- you know, four or five decades before Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. Not even. What do you think about that? Well, uh, it's another one of these things where, like Julius Caesar's deification uh, was sort of modeled on the myths of Romulus, uh, who uh, disappeared on the battlefield. They couldn't find a stitch of his clothing, a fragment of his armor, uh, and then shortly thereafter, he appeared in a blaze of glory uh, before uh, one of the senators and said, well, from now on, you can call me Corinus uh, because uh, I've, I've been declared a god and I'm giving you the, the charge to tell my Romans to go forth and, and conquer the world. And then he ascended back into the sky. Well, the uh, and then Augustus was actually ah, was actually called the savior. And uh, there is a monument uh, discovered some years ago uh, over there, uh, I guess, in in, uh, today's Turkey, somewhere, I forget, uh, that says the beginning of the gospel uh, of uh, Augustus and how uh, the new age of peace has come about because of him and so forth. Uh, It's like, and then it becomes more and more of a... uh, theological item than just protocol and propaganda with the deification of the emperors to the point where um, Seneca wrote this this parody called the pumpkinification of Claudius, where he dies and goes up to Olympus and they're they're saying, what, another one of these guys? (laughs) It's pretty funny. Uh, And... uh, but yeah, there was so much of it, and and the Oriental kings were already gods that it's uh, it's like yeah, all of this stuff is reflected in the Gospels with Jesus. But I, I, it's probably too late to say where exactly which stream it was that fed into this. But it could have just as easily have been uh, Augustus and so forth. Yeah, uh, there's... That, that would make sense. Here's the coin that says Devious mm. Ilius. There's this. There's the uh, star of Venus, the uh, comet. I shouldn't say star. It's comet. And um, yeah, and he, one of his titles was Prince of Peace. Mm. So, I mean, I'm not saying that Jesus is Augustus. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is there are ideas. There are archetypes. There are sort of fads in the air. When people are writing yep. their when people are writing their gospels, they're even if it's subconsciously, they're remembering. Like when someone writes a song, they're going to write a song based on the inspi- inspired music that they listen to. Mm-hmm. And I think it's no different with with scriptures in the ancient world. Um, but I also think that, um, like like for example, let me let me throw you let me give you an example. Superman, right? Mm. He's got a cape. He wears a he wears a tight suit. He flies. He's got powers. Well, you can say that about a lot of other su- superheroes. They're not copying mm-hmm. Superman. They're way different. They have way different abilities. They have different enemies, different universe, different everything. But there are some like norms that you have to check when you're writing mm-hmm. a superhero comic. There are the norms. And I'm mm-hmm. what I'm getting at is these are the norms. When you have a savior, mm-hmm. a figure who's a, a messiah, who's going to save the world from the evil, that's that's the archetype. There's there's a there's there's boxes that get checked. The Richard Carrier is really good at explaining this in his book. Mm. Richard Carrier in uh in the history of Jesus lays the, out exactly what I'm talking about. He, he can explain it a lot better. That is a good book to read if you want to understand what I'm saying. It's not about yeah, he's, he's a genius for sure. Yeah, or Adonis, and they'll put it next to Jesus and say Jesus was born on December 25th. No, Addis wasn't. Well, it's like that's not what that's not what we're saying. Nobody's trying to make that argument. We're looking at the big picture. We're looking at the archetype behind these characters. If that makes mm-hmm. sense. And I always like to point out that uh, these these things uh, are are also what I believe Durkheim called ideal types. That when you find a whole bunch of things with. Uh, very crucial 
elements in common, you group those together and for the moment ignore the many differences that are also there between them. And, uh, and then you use the yardstick of the ideal type to uh, compare the, the phenomena and to understand why they differ, where they differ. Like uh, this comes up in world religions. Uh, they, how are you going to define a religion? Well, there's no one thing that fits them all, but there are a number of salient features, but like most of them have some kind of God. But uh, Jainism does not. It has ascended masters, uh, sort of, uh, and uh, Theravada Buddhism does not. Uh, so, uh, but, but it's, it's obvious that they are religions. And so the thing to ask is, well, how is it that these uh, wound up different at these points? And you can usually see why. Uh, their particular scheme of salvation, like it involves meditation, uh, introspection, it's not a question of somebody saving you. Uh, whereas in the all these other ones, it is. So you can yeah. usually tell. But the fact that you find something missing here in common, oh, they're not all exactly alike. Well, nobody's saying they right. are. That's not the point. But if yeah. they do have a skeleton of, of where most of the elements are present, you, then you're talking about an archetypal thing, and it means something. Yeah, I got one more super chat. But before I get to that, I found the quote that I wanted to read from Krishna, the one that really, really rings, like rings a bell. Of you, you, just let me read it. He says, "The Lord dwells in the hearts of all creatures and whirls them round upon the wheel of Maya. Run to Him for refuge with all your strength, and peace profound will be yours through His grace." I give you these precious words of wisdom. Reflect on them as you choose. These are the last words I shall speak to you, dear one, for your spirit. You are very, and he says, be aware of me always, adore me, make every act and offering to me, and you shall not, you shall come to me. This I promise, for you are dear to me. Abandon all supports and look to me for protection. I shall purify you from the sins of the past. Woo! Hmm. He's forgiving sins. That's what people want in a savior. Yeah, that's it. That's. That's why and they figure there must be one, and then it all starts to accumulate from there. Yeah, Dharma Defender, thank you for the $5 super chat. He says, in the Syriac, the word Quran means lectionary. Lectionary is a daily readings of the Bible, still done in traditional churches like Orthodox. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Hebrew word kor, kura, or kora, or something like that, means read. So I wonder if there's some sort of Semitic cognate going on with Quran and Korah, but I'm, I'm not an expert on that. I don't know. What is the, the biblical word? I couldn't quite hear. Oh, uh, the Hebrew word for read is Korah, but Quran, I'm not sure if there's a, because there's, you know, Arabic and Hebrew are like really closely connected, both Semitic. Yeah, I, I imagine it is. Uh, yeah. in, in the story of the angel Gabriel first, uh, calling Muhammad to be a prophet, he says, recite in the name of thy Lord who created man from clots of blood. Recite uh, for thy Lord uh, taught the use of the tongue and the pen. Uh, and uh, he says, I, I can't recite. And he says, well, you know, God's going to do it. It's exactly like Jeremiah and Moses when they're told to do this. <laughs> Look, you got the wrong guy. I don't know. Uh, because I'm I'm enabling it, and um, so why recite? Well, the this was a kind of a development from what the uh, Kahins did, inspired poets uh, in pre-Islamic Arabia, uh, where they would say that a jinn, a genie, uh, was was standing on their chest, and and um, they went into a kind of a fit. And then from there on in, they were able to just come out with these uh, oracular 
uh, rhyming uh, predictions and fortunes and all that. Well, that's the same word, just different vowel points as Kohane or priest in the Bible, though it also sometimes means a diviner, uh, a fortune teller. And because it's the same word and really means the same thing uh, between Arabic and Hebrew. And so you would recite what God was telling you. And the Muslims believe that every revelation of Muhammad was dictated from the heavenly book by the angel Gabriel. So when he would utter his revelations, he'd be reciting a transcription of a book, or at least that was what they figured they were doing. And, and of course, Muslims recite the Quran all the time. Uh, and, and so they did in the Bible when you didn't have a printing press or couldn't afford scribes. You had to meditate and recite or almost the same thing in that context. Yeah, that is the final super chat. And um, anything else you wanted to plug on or let everyone know, anything like that? Well, just one thing I, I like to reiterate, some people hear this as uh, a challenge uh, and an undermining of their faith because they believe their faith has to be unique. Well, suppose it isn't, does that make it all false and worthless? I don't see how. Uh, it, uh, it, to me, it, it kind of uh, buttresses the whole thing that it's uh, it's not something that somebody cooked up, that these things come from the deep wells inside everybody's collective unconscious or whatever, which is why you have things like in the Bible, deep speaketh unto deep. That's what's going on and why you have all the parallels. Yeah, well said. And like I always say, you, hold on, let me get the outro ready before I say this. <laughs> you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The demiurge has no power over.